Okay, so good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the National VTS session number three. Um, so today we're going to look at some AKT questions, some consultation skills, and portfolio GP careers case studies. Okay, so let's uh, get everyone started. Um, those of you that haven't met me before, haven't been to one of these, my name is uh, Mohibur Rahman. I'm a portfolio GP based here in Birmingham and Solihull. And I'll tell you a little bit about my own portfolio career uh, towards the end, as well as three other case studies. Uh, so my main role now is I'm the medical director of eMedica, but I have various clinical roles, which I'll talk to you about later. So uh, this is a secure unit I work at uh, for ladies with severe mental health illness. Um, and this is um, sort of you know, getting ready to go to practice. And this is teaching. So. So what we're going to do, we're going to do teaching on three different topics. It's very interactive, so please do get involved in the discussion. Okay. So what we're going to do, we're going to go through, as I said, three sessions really. Uh, first session, first sort of 15, 20 minutes, we're going to do some AKT revision. We'll do um, a stats question, a couple of admin questions, a clinical question. Then we'll do the consultation skills. We're going to do a sample case, and then we're going to look at portfolio careers. And then the last part, you can ask anything you like about GP training or GP careers. So here we go. I'm going to start with some high yield AKT questions. We're going to do four in total. When the question comes on the screen, you'll have 55 seconds to have a look at it. And then I'll launch the poll after that. Once the poll launches, you've got about 10 seconds to select something. OK, so we're going to go straight into the first question. So the most popular answers uh, were A and B followed by D, but actually pretty much every single answer has been picked by at least a few doctors. Um, so you, know, you can see that, um, but yeah, the two most popular ones are A and B. So I'll put the chat back on now. Um, so the correct answer here is B and C. So actually quite a lot of you picked B, but hardly anyone picked C. So a lot of you would actually get no mark. So the way that multiple best answers work in the AKT, the marking is very strict. If you get one of these right and you get one wrong, you won't get half a mark, unfortunately. You get no marks at all, okay? So let's look at why. So first thing is, you know, this patient um, had a ruptured spleen and they've had a splenectomy. What's the big risk that we worry about? Type into the chat, what's the big risk we worry about when someone has had their spleen taken out? Why is it that we want to think about vaccinations? So yeah, absolutely. The big risk we worry about is capsular bacterial infections leading to an overwhelming sepsis because they can't mount the normal response, okay? That's the big thing that we worry about, okay? So two things I want to highlight that are really important in your, your succeeding in the AKT. One is you've got to have the knowledge base, right? And you know, vaccination is an important topic, so you, you need to know these things. But the other is technique. So a lot of you that maybe didn't quite get the mark, don't worry if you didn't get it here. There's, the point of coming to something like this is that if we can help you identify these things, you won't make these mistakes in the exam. So for example, the most popular answer was A, annual PPV23, i.e. the pneumococcal vaccine. But you see, that's only every five years. It's not annual. So that's why that's wrong. So you see, a lot of you will have just seen, see now, I know they need Pneumovax. You just saw that and maybe you didn't read carefully. So reading carefully, both the question, the answer options, uh, you know, both of those are really, really important because otherwise you can have a really good knowledge base and still lose marks, unfortunately. So the things that you do need, annual flu vaccine injection, and then two doses of men B. Um, these, the reason they're wrong, hip men C, you only need one dose. Men ACWY, you only need one dose. DTAP IPV is not required, okay? Um, and then this one, you do get a dose, but then it's not every year, it's every five years after that first dose, okay? So that's why, um, a is incorrect. So just to recap, you'd have to get both B and C right to get the one mark. If you've got one right and one wrong in the exam, you wouldn't get a mark for that. Okay, so let's move on to 
just recap these things, okay? So the vaccinations for patients who don't have a spleen, they need one hip mens just one dose. They need one men ACWY. You wait at least a month after the hip men C before you give them that men ACWY. They need two doses of men B at least a month between each one. And then pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine, that's the PPV23, that's every five years. Flu vaccine annually, okay, the injection, okay. And then it's not just, I mean, this is specific to patients who have lost a spleen, right, this question that we asked, but these requirements of vaccinations would also apply to other patients with dysfunction of the spleen. So for example, someone with significant sickle cell disease or celiac disease, they often would have um, dysfunction of the spleen. And if that was the case, then they would also need to be considered for vaccination. Okay, let's do a stats question. You're allowed to use a calculator because you're allowed to use a calculator in the exam. I wouldn't expect anyone to do this without a calculator, okay? So once again, um, I know that this is an area that people often struggle with. Every single answer option has been picked and someone's even picked option I. I'm sure that was a, just a misclick, okay? Um, but someone even picked option I, which doesn't exist. Okay, so the key thing that's being asked here is we're being asked to work out prevalence, okay? Now you can see you've been asked to pick prevalence over a period of three years, 2017, 18, 19. So where it's over a period of time rather than just at, at one specific point in time. We call this period prevalence, okay? The more common type of prevalence um, is point prevalence, where you take prevalence at a snapshot in time, okay? And so someone had requested that we specifically cover how to calculate period prevalence. Um, the, the concept's actually very similar, but I thought I'd go through it, okay? So just looking at the answers, I said every option was picked, but the most popular one was D, 0.86%. This was the most popular answer, okay? Um, about 30% of people pick this one. So the correct answer is actually H, 6.3%, which uh, only about 7% of people picked, all right? Um, so it's a hard question. Um, let's go through what is prevalence, the different types of prevalence, and then I'll come back and I'll work through this example with you to show you how you can do it in the 57 seconds or so that you've got in the exam. So prevalence is the proportion of a population with a disease, okay? It's not just about the new cases, it's the new cases plus the existing cases. So the more common type is at a specific point of time, i.e. on the 31st of August, 2020, how many patients in your practice have got this disease? So that would include all the ones that have got it, you know, previously and anyone that recently got it, the total number out of your total population of patients, okay? But quite often with prevalence, we, we wanna look at it over a period of time, over a year, two years, three years, 10 years, we call this period prevalence, okay? So point prevalence, all you do is the total number of cases, so that's existing cases plus any new cases, add that up first, then divide it by the population. Then to get it into a percentage, which is how we normally talk about prevalence, you need to do the last step, which is multiply by 100, okay? Period prevalence, you get all the cases during a given time. So i.e., in this case, it was three years, right? So you add up the new cases in each of those years, add them to the existing cases, and you divide it by the population over that period. Now, can you see the population of your practice might go up and down. Some years, some patients leave, other years you get new patients, some patients will be born, some patients will pass away. So you'll see that often changes. So for period prevalence, what we look at is either you look at the average population over that period of time. And so that question, for example, gave us the average list size from 2017 to 2019, I, the average over that period. So we're gonna use this as the bottom number, okay? Um, or sometimes what you can do is, um, if, if they don't give you an average, sometimes you, you might 
be given, you know, this was the population in this year, this was the population in this year, this was the, then you could calculate the average yourself. But in 57 seconds, that would be hard to expect you to do this and calculate, you know, the average. That's why we've given you the average. Okay. So let's look at the calculation. So remember, prevalence is first, you need to work out the total number of patients. So we're looking at patients with diabetes. These are the new cases in each of these three years. So if we add these up, 52 plus 48 is 100 plus 41 is 141. We're going to add that to the existing number of patients, which is 900 who already had a diagnosis. So that gives us 1,041. So 900 plus 52 plus 41 plus 48, that's 1,041. Okay. So those of you that pick B, all you've done there is got the total number of cases. All right. And then you divide that by the population. So the population is 16,450. Okay, so 1,041 divided by 16,450, that gives us 0 0.063. So again, those of you that picked F, what you've done there is you've forgotten to do the last step because these answers are in percentages, you can see, from C to H. And that is to get anything as a percentage, percent just means per 100. So you've got to multiply by 100 to work out as a percentage. So 0 0.063 times 100 is 6.3%. That's how we got the answer H. Okay, so that's period prevalence. Now, the most popular answer was D, 0.86%. Those of you that calculated that, what you've done is you've just calculated the wrong thing. So again, goes to technique. Some, it might be that you don't know, you know in terms of you haven't revised stats for a long time, so you forgot uh, that prevalence is all cases, old cases plus new cases. And so you were calculating incidence. Others, it might be technique that, you know, you just saw these and you thought, okay, I'm just interested in the new cases. And you actually didn't look at um, the existing cases okay you know it could be that you, you calculated the incidence rather than the prevalence okay which is what you'd get um if you had done that that's what you'd get is 0.86 if you calculated the incidence so incidence is just the new cases out of the total population i.e you'd add these up 141 out of 16,450 multiplied by 100 okay so that's um, the difference between prevalence and uh, incidence so this is one of the common things that you need to know how to calculate. So what are some of the other calculations that you should know and know also what the definition of these things are? So incidence and prevalence we just covered, but then different types of average. So mean, median, mode, these are all different types of average and how to calculate them. Uh, very common sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, negative predictive value. Uh, and then the different types of risk, absolute risk, absolute risk reduction, absolute risk increase, relative risk, relative risk reduction. Uh, numbers needed to treat or numbers needed to harm, odds and odds ratio, and then quality adjusted life years or disability adjusted life years. Okay, so these are all, now calculations aren't all the types of questions that there are in stats in the AKT. You'll also have questions getting you to interpret data, graphs and charts and types of study. But calculations will always feature, there will always be some questions involving calculations. And if you find stats difficult and you want to learn not just all the calculations, but also the new, new style data interpretation questions, all the different graphs and charts, the types of study. Our next stats webinar is on the 13th of October from 7 till 10.30. In that three and a half hours, you'll cover everything that you need. Okay, so let's move on to the next question in the admin domain, health and safety. This was highlighted in the last examiner's report as a problem area. Of those that did use the poll, uh, B and E were popular answers. Now, something important here is this is what's called a negatively framed question. You can see it's not asking which are recommended, it's asking which are not recommended for clinical use. All right. Um, and this is a very topical issue at the moment, isn't it? Because we're all going through, you know, 
bags and bags and boxes and boxes of PP. So bags of aprons and boxes of gloves we're getting through at the moment. And a lot of practices now, you know, they're getting ready for their flu campaigns um, and then getting ready for the fact that with winter and COVID still here, we're going to get through a lot of PP, aren't we? Okay, so uh, part of the admin domain are those things that when you are running your own practice, you need to know. So health and safety of your team, for example. Um, and so this is, you know, one of the things that you're going to be thinking about. So the popular answers I can see in the chat, uh, B, E, C, E, um, D, E. Uh, so it looks like a, a lot, lot of people have picked E and then it's either B, C or D. Um, all of these have been picked. Um, I don't think, no, some people have also picked A, Mitra, okay. Um, so the correct answers are B and E. So those of you that got both of those, well done, you'd get the mark, okay. So again, just to highlight about technique. So some people might have missed that it's negatively framed, that it's asking which are not recommended. And you might have just thought, which are recommended. You thought, you know what, I've used these ones a lot. Those are my personal favorite gloves. It's, I use nitrile all the time. And then, you know, latex, you've all used latex gloves. So again, very easy to have good knowledge and lose a mark if you don't read the question carefully. Okay. So nitrile is fine for clinical. Neoprene is fine for clinical. Often surgeons use these. Uh, latex are the fairly standard gloves. Okay. Um, vinyl gloves, you'll sometimes see some people using these in clinical environments, uh, but that's that actually not recommended that, uh, to be used in clinical environments. People are doing it because they're trying to save some money. These are a lot cheaper. But what these are recommended for is they're fine for cleaning. So, you know, like we all got enhanced cleaning now. We're using a lot more bleach and things like that. Vinyl's fine. If you, you know, don't want to spend the money on uh, nitrile or latex for that, that's fine. And these sort of plastic gloves, these are only really recommended for food handling. Even for cleaning, they're no good because bleach will go through this, okay? Um, they often have little perforations. And if they don't, they're so thin, bleach could burn through it. So. You know, these are fine for food handling, but not really much else, okay? And as I mentioned, you know, these are like, these are the ones that I use. So this is from my, my last clinic. Uh, we had an outbreak at the unit I work at. So we went into, this is the uh, conference room rather than my normal clinic room, because there's more space here for us to social distance and, you know, have patients a bit spread out and have the nurse spread out and went back into full PP. So, but these are nitrile gloves. And uh, I, I'd never been in, I don't normally go in the conference room because uh, this is where, like the psych team normally do their ward rounds in here. But uh, look, look at their little sign here. A party without cake is just a meeting. Okay, a good sentiment. Right, so let's have a look at one more question in relation to health and safety. So again, I can see pretty much every single answer has been um, selected. Someone had just actually asked, what about latex allergy? So um, it's quite a common thing, isn't it, latex allergy? Um, okay, so that's time. So the correct answer is kosh. Um, so the correct answer is B, kosh, okay, is the correct answer. So well done, uh, quite a few of you got that. Lots of people picked one of the others though, okay? So I'll go through what these different things are. So dupe, Dupe is uh, the thing that we use to denature control drugs before we get rid of them, okay? So it's like a special uh, chemical that you use to denature control drugs so that they become basically useless, okay? GDPR is the General Data Protection Regulation. This is uh, to do with access to medical information, to you know information that might be held within your patient record. It's a European law, so it applies at the moment, but it won't after Brexit, okay? What will apply if someone wants to get access to their own information will be the Data Protection Act 2018. These other three are all related to do with health and safety, so let's talk about them. So the principal legislation in the UK that is to do with health and safety uh, in the workplace is the Health and Safety at Work Act, okay? 
Um, within that, there are sort of several other regulations that have stemmed from that. Okay, so the important ones for us as, as sort of medics, COSH is the control of substances hazardous to health. So it includes that we have the duty to assess and risk manage any substances that might be in the practice, in the clinical setting, that could be hazardous to health. So it includes, for example, you've got to have a plan in place if blood is spilt, how you're going to make sure that it, you know, people don't slip on it. And that, of course, you know, blood could be if, if someone then uh, also had a cut, for example, you know, there's a risk of spreading diseases through blood, right? Things like vomit, um, things like in a hot water tank, Legionella, okay, so Legionnaire's disease, testing for it and making sure you, you deal with it. But within that, latex is a substance that is common to, you know, relatively common, can, can cause allergies. And so it falls as part of that because it's a substance that's hazardous to health. Do you see? Okay. Riddle is the reporting of injuries, diseases, and dangerous occurrences. Okay. Regulation. So, for example, let's say now someone at work banged their head and was knocked unconscious and then they had to go to hospital. We have a duty to report that because of the fact that it happened in the workplace. It's a work related injury. Okay. So, Riddle has various things. Similarly, there are certain occupational illnesses. So, if someone got um, noise induced hearing loss, as a result of their job, then you know their employer would have a duty to report that under Riddle. It, you know, in a GP surgery, if someone got carpal tunnel syndrome or they got repetitive stress injury, let's say your secretary got repetitive stress, stress injury, you know that's an occupational illness that falls under Riddle. And then NPSA is the National Patient Safety Agency. So what they do is they put out various regulations. But one of the situations where we might look at that is, you know, we look at what's the risk of something happening and the likelihood that it would occur and the impact of it. So for example, if we establish that we think that there's a, a risk that our computers would go down and we wouldn't get access to the records. And if that happened, you know, we might not know about people's um, other drugs and miss an interaction. And so it could actually cause significant harm. Then we have a duty to do something about it. So you might have a backup, for example. Okay. And so questions have appeared about all of these in past exams. Okay. And again, if you want to learn about all the different admin topics, not just the health and safety, but also practice management, the different types of GP contract, GMS, PMS, uh, PCLMS, APMS, uh, there have been big changes to the GMS contract uh, this summer. So, you know, things like that. Our next admin webinar is on the 14th of October, um, again, 7 till 10.30. Okay, we'll cover all of it in one evening. Um, and then we also have lots of free support. So, you know, if you're not already a member of the GP training support group, um, someone in the team will post a link to that in a minute. Um, you know, do join that. Uh, when we've got 30 days to each exam, and we're coming up to 30 days to the October exam shortly, uh, I will post one video every day with a question, uh, answer, and an explanation. And then if you missed some of the lockdown learning GP training teaching that we've done and the past sessions of this monthly webinar, again, on our YouTube channel, you can get access to that. And I'm also running, specifically for those sitting the October exam, a high yield revision webinar. We'll do 15 high yield questions in one evening. Uh, and that's on the 7th of October. Okay. And then we have lots of, you know, resources that you might want to get on top of those free things um, that we've been using to help people at various stages. So we've got our clinical case cards, which offer rapid revision. Latest set were published September 2020. So they're bang up to date. OK, so, you know, for example, these have got the 2020 Impetigo guidelines. Uh, they've got the latest hypertension guidelines. Uh, you know, these are the bang up to date ones. Um, so bang up to date, easy way to learn lots of guidelines, both useful for everyday practice, AKT and RCA. Our main AKT course, which covers all three domains, includes a three teaching mocks, a big focus on exam technique, which will make a huge difference, is running this Saturday. OK, uh, it's in Birmingham. We're full in the room in Birmingham because we're going to take so many because of social distancing. But the live stream has still got spaces. OK, again, someone will post uh, the link into the chat for you. Um, and then those masterclass webinars uh, are on the 13th, 14th, 15th. On the 18th, we've got our AKT 200 question crammer. We'll do 450 question teaching mocks, go through revision of 160 clinical topics in one day, 20 stats, 20 admin. And then all of these together, plus our online revision, come as a bundle with 110 hours of learning, the Pass Plus bundle. And our most comprehensive bundle, 220 hours of learning, our Pass Guarantee package. So there's the dates for the next set of AKT things that we're running. So this weekend, the full day course, stats on the 13th, admin on the 14th, clinical crammer on the 15th. That's all the clinical topics 
that the examiners mentioned in the last 10 years worth of examiners reports, these things come up again and again and again. And then our AKT 200 mock crammer, 18th of October. Okay, and then those are the case cards. Um, you can see those I showed you earlier there. One of the things that's really helpful about these, apart from them being very concise and up to date, is that they're mapped to the same things that are important in the exam. So, you know, some of them are about investigation, some are about making the diagnosis, like how things present, some are about prescribing, some are about management, and some are about emergencies. Okay. So let's move on now to some consultation skills. Before we do that, let me just see if there are any questions specifically about AKT. Okay. Um, Someone said, who should report cases via RIDOR? So remember that the AKT is a GP exam. So it's going to be you as a partner or you to delegate someone. So, you know, um, I might do it in my practice, for example, but in some cases we might allocate the practice manager to do it. But ultimately the partners are responsible for it. Do you see? In hospital, it would be occupational health, but you're not going to be tested on what happens in hospital. This is a GP exam, okay? Not a, a hospital exam, all right? Right, let's move on to talk about consultation skills, right? Um, someone's asked some questions about getting into GP training. But that's not something we cover in this. This is for people in training already, okay? So um, if you've got questions about getting into training, feel free to email me or send me a message, okay? So we're gonna do a case, have a look. This is the patient information that you can see before you've, uh, you know, uh, patient comes in. This is gonna be a face-to-face -face case, okay? So this patient, um, you can see we've already triaged them. They've got a cough, recently been tested negative for COVID-19 we've realized that you know we need a bit more information perhaps we might want to examine them for example that's what we've asked them to come in okay so that's the background okay so i'll be the patient all right so i'll be mr william blakely um let's have a start um, would anyone like to start off feel free to use the chat to ask any questions okay okay so cyrus said how can i help our oh, doc look i just need some antibiotics i've had this cough for ages I don't want to waste your time. I'm missing time off work. If you just give me some antibiotics, I'll get back to it. So can I have antibiotics? Yes or no? Someone said, tell me more about my cough. What do you want to know, doc? You know, like I'm coughing up all times of day and night. Uh, it's a bit worse at night, to be honest, but uh, I get it in the day. Um, it's really annoying um, and I'm just fed up of it. I know I know it's an infection, so I just want antibiotics because then I'll feel right and I get back to work. Since when have I had the cough? I've had this cough for about six days now, and you know I've done my best. I've tried just like taking cough medicine. I've tried you know like honey in my tea, but it's not working. I, I just need some antibiotics. Can I have some antibiotics, doctor? Try to ask your questions how you would ask it to a person. For example, someone said red flags. Now you see. If you don't ask specific questions, if you say to a patient, have you got red flags? What does that mean to a patient? So think about what we actually ask. So someone's asked, are you bringing anything up? Uh, well, like sometimes I, you know, hack up some sort of like, it's like cloudy white. So yeah, I do bring some stuff up. Any difficulty of breathing? Yes, definitely. So especially if I have like a coughing fit, then it's really, really difficult for me to catch my breath. And I'm definitely more wheezy. I've, I've been using my blue inhaler lots and lots the last five days. Someone asked, any blood? No, no, heavens no. If I had blood, I would have come much sooner, doc. Any temperature? Not really. Any chest pain? Yeah, you know, sometimes if I have a big coughing fit, you know, like you cough, 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 I find it's a bit sore after that. Any recent travel? Chance would be a fine thing, doc. Everyone's locked down, isn't it? I can't get anywhere. Love to have a holiday. Is it interfering with my day to day? Yeah, well, it just, it's really annoying more than anything. But as I said, if I have a coughing fit, I get a bit sort of wheezy. So then I use the blue inhaler, then I, you know, it takes about 20 minutes to kick in, then I'm fine. But otherwise, yeah, like for example, this last week, I've not done any exercise. I just, I don't feel up to it. Someone's asked, that, am I vomited? No, just, you know, like when something when you cough, you can't really stop it. It, it takes a, a bit of time before it stops, right? Anyone in the family with similar illness? No, everyone else is okay, thankfully, okay? Um, you know, we actually all had tests two weeks ago for that COVID because at that point, my daughter had a really bad temperature. And so, you know, like we phoned the 111, they sent us down to one of these testing centers um we had the test so thankfully that was all negative for all of us some of us have had similar symptoms in the past of course doc you know like i've had coughs obviously i mean i've had asthma since i was a child so you know i've had coughs and colds over the years 
It's just that usually after about three or four days, you feel like you've turned the corner and you feel like you're getting better. So look, you've asked a lot of questions. Look, look, look the reason I've come down here, I just want to get the antibiotics. So look, can I have some antibiotics, please? Can you just do me a script? Is that okay? Okay, so I'm going to pause you guys there, okay? Just uh, stop with your question for a second. Now, do you notice this patient's asked four times now if they can have antibiotics. Now, you see, if you don't address that, if you don't signpost that you need to ask some questions before you can make a decision, what's going to happen is the patient's going to think one of two things. Either they're going to think that you're not listening to them and they might get annoyed, or they might feel that you basically um, are just ignoring them, okay, or that you don't care. And you don't want any of these things, okay? So it'd be really important if someone asks things like that right at the beginning, okay, that you use the technique of signposting. So let me show you an example of how you might do that, okay? But I, 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 I can hear from what you're saying that it's really important to you that you want to feel better and you said you want to get back to work and you said you like antibiotics. Now, before we can decide if antibiotics are the right thing for the situation, I need to ask a few more questions and I will need to examine you. So please bear with me. As soon as we get through these things, then we'll be able to make a decision. You see, what the patient sees is that you've heard me. You see it's important to me. You were listening when I said that I want to get back to work and that you're asking these questions because without doing that, you can't make a decision. You're not ignoring me. You do care. Do you see the difference? You can then ask your questions without the patient feeling like you're not listening or you don't care or getting upset. So you can see we've signposted that, that I can hear this is important to you and we're going to come on to it in a little bit. But first, we've got to do this. Do you see? Okay. So good. So what other things might we ask? So someone had mentioned red flags. Are there any other specific things that you might want to ask this patient? What are some of the red flags that would make you worry about um, you know, someone who's had a, a cough? So someone's asked, why do you think you need antibiotics? That's a good question. Well, I, I, feel I need it because, as I said, normally when I get a cough, after three or four days, you feel better, don't you? But I've had this now six days. Today's the seventh day. So like, I know it must be something that needs antibiotics. The only way it's going to get better. Okay. Someone's asked a good question. Do you smoke? Actually, Doc, I'll be honest with you. You know, I've given up. But, you know, it's been really, really stressful. Ever since all of this lockdown, you know, I'm stuck at home. Um, I'm able to work from home. But at the moment, for example, the cough gets in the way of that. Um, and so, you know, I've had to take a few days off and I, I want to get back to work, right? But it's just been really, really stressful. So I'll be honest, I started back smoking. Yeah, last month I started back smoking. So someone's asked any weight loss. That's another important question. No, no doc, uh, if anything, I've put on, you know, they call it COVID weight, isn't it? Because stuck at home, you know, I, 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 I was helping out the government a lot. I'll be honest with you, eat out to help out. I ate it all and I helped them a lot, right? But now, obviously, you know, it's on my belly now. So someone's asked about... Um, any reflux issues? Not really, Doc. Don't think so. Um, how many cigarettes? Uh, about 10 a day. It's not that much. Any night sweats? Someone's asked. No, no night sweats. So what are some of the other red flags? So don't forget loss of appetite. That's one of the new red flags, isn't it? That might help you decide if someone needs an x-ray, for example. Okay. Okay, good. So let's move on then and look at some of the things that will be really important. So, you know, the first things you want to look at is things that you've already asked. You know, when did it start? A bit more detail about the symptoms. So, is it dry? Have they got sputum? What color is there? Is you know, is there any blood in there? Okay. What have they tried? So, how often are they using their blue inhaler? That would be important. Are they taking their beclomethasone, their steroid inhaler, regularly? Have they been taking that on time? Are they getting short of breath? Okay. You know, how much are they using their inhaler? Has that increased compared to normal? All of these things would be important, right? Okay. Um, and then we've gone through some of these important red flags now. We brought this patient in because we want to examine, but what would you like to examine? So just type into the chat, what kinds of things would you like to examine? So I'm using my blue inhaler. A few people have asked about that. It's a good question. I'm using my blue inhaler. I take like four puffs, probably five, six times a day. I've been using it the last few days. Um, and then my brown one, obviously just two puffs in the morning, two puffs in the evening. Okay, great. So I can see people have talked about the vitals. So pulse, blood pressure, um, O2 sats, uh, peak flow, Okay, temperature, all of this will be important. And then don't forget the most important thing, listen to the chest, right? Okay, good. So pulse, blood pressure, temperature, oxygen sats, look at their ear, nose and throat. Okay, you know, examine the chest and then peak flow is really, really 
useful, isn't it? Because it can help you doing things like the pulse, looking at their respirations and their peak flow. It can help you classify if someone's got an exacerbation of asthma, for example, is it um, acute severe asthma? You know, is it just an acute exacerbation, but not at the level of acute severe asthma? Is it potentially acute life-threatening asthma? Because we're going to manage those very differently. One's going to be blue lights. One's going to be, you know, needs to be seen in hospital. One might be we manage in the community. Okay, so th th that's really, really important. So let's have a look. This is what we find. Okay, so have a look at those findings. And remember, peak flow, we look at percentage of expected based on both height and age. Okay. Okay, so you've seen all the exam findings now, right? So what do you think the diagnosis is? So pulse is fine. That's an important metric because if someone's tachycardic and tachypneic, it's one of the markers to say that it could be acute severe asthma, right? Okay, so pulse is fine. Blood pressure is okay. Temperature is fine. O2 saps are good. Nothing to see in ear, nose and throat, okay? Um, chest, lots of wheeze, but no crackles. Okay, and then peak flows, okay, 90% of expected, actually not too bad. Okay, so what do we think is going on? Yeah, so it sounds like a viable exacerbation of asthma, right? Okay, it sounds like they've got upper respiratory tract infection, you know, this cough, the fact that they've got white sputum rather than colored sputum, and that could well be a smoker's cough, right? Um, and then all of this looks good, doesn't it? Okay, but of course, you know, even with a viral illness, if someone is um, got asthma, it can make them really quite unwell. OK, they've already got a you know lower reserve than someone without it. Right. OK, so but it doesn't fulfill the criteria to be acute severe asthma, does it? Because then you'd expect them to, you know, their peak flow to be significantly decreased 50 percent or so or less. Maybe they can't finish a sentence, um, you know, things like that. OK, good. So then if that's what we think is going on, how are you going to manage this patient? Are we going to admit them? Are we going to send them for an X-ray? Are we going to give them antibiotics? Are we going to have them assessed in hospital? Are we going to manage them in the community? If so, what are we going to do for them? You know, what we're we going to do? Okay, so someone said that they would offer a delayed prescription uh, of clarithromycin. Someone else has said that they would uh, check the inhaler technique and give some steroids uh, orally. Someone else has said they'd just reassure. Someone else talking about smoking cessation. All right. Um, Someone said that antibiotics are short course or delayed prescription for antibiotics. OK, uh, check the inhaler technique, maybe give them a nebulizer, maybe increase the step. Uh, so add in a leukotriene. Right. So let's have a look at that. So how would you manage this patient? So this looks like an upper respiratory tract infection that's caused an exacerbation of the asthma. But there's no clinical focus on infection. So actually, were you to in real life, but also especially in the exam, were you to give this patient either a prescription for antibiotics or a delayed prescription, that would be a fail in terms of how that would be marked. Why? Because a delayed prescription is totally inappropriate to give someone who has got uh, an upper respiratory tract infection. Because what you're saying is that the patient can decide if it have, they've now got a bacterial infection in five days time. That's not appropriate. When might be appropriate to give a delayed prescription? A good example is where You've got someone with a sore throat and, you know, their fever pain score is at a level that you think, OK, you know what, there's a moderate probability and that's why you're giving. I, it, it probably is bacterial, but it might get better on its own. Or they've got otitis media with effusion and then, you know, again, that will respond to antibiotics, but it will often get better on its own. But there is clearly something that would respond to antibiotics. But if they've got a virus, by giving them antibiotics, you're giving them something that cannot help them, but may well harm them. But also what you're doing, which is really inappropriate, is letting them make the decision that, OK, I think it's bacterial now. That's inappropriate. OK. If they're not better after another week or so, or they start getting a fever or they start coughing up muck, then the right management for them to come back for you to re-examine, reassess, and then you could give prescription. So giving delayed prescription would be a fail in the exam. OK, that would be inappropriate. What you could consider, given that you know, they've got a lot of wheeze and it's having an impact. You could consider giving a very short course of steroids. So for an adult, you might give, depending on their weight and size, you know, something like 40 milligrams, maybe 50 milligrams for five days. In children, it's going to be much lower based on their age and sort of weight, right? What's really important is advice on symptom management. So, you know, check the inhaler technique, um, you know, make sure that they're doing that correctly. Tell them, like, they might be taking some paracetamol, for example, um, you know, if they've been feeling a bit under the weather, 
that that's fine, but not to take ibuprofen because that could make their wheeze worse. Something really important would be an opportunity to offer them smoking cessation advice again, because you could highlight that, look, you started smoking again a month ago. And, you know, of course, you said that your daughter had a fever and she was unwell. It's great to hear that she doesn't have COVID. But, you know, if people have been unwell in the house, um, you know, the fact that you're smoking, that does mean that you're more susceptible to picking up infections like this. And we've got a background of asthma and it's going to make it worse. And so that might be why it's taking longer for you to recover than maybe if you had one last year when you weren't smoking. OK, and then safety, I think, would be really important, wouldn't it? That if they start getting worse, if they start coughing up muck, if they notice any blood, if they get really, really short of breath and the uh, salbutamol isn't relieving it. Um, you know, all of these things that they need to get medical help. OK, so all of that would be important. OK. Right. So in terms of interpersonal, a couple of things that are really, really important. So one is not to miss the psychosocial impact, the fact that they're missing work and might be losing money in this time when you know, a lot of people are struggling. OK, that would be really important. So picking up on that cue, you know, I want to get back to work. OK, even people that are working from home can see if they're too unwell to do their job. In a lot of cases, they're not going to get paid. OK, um, you know, some people are self-employed or they do you know, contract work so that they don't have, um, you know, like sick pay, if you like. Giving a clear explanation of the diagnosis. OK, uh, you know, the fact that this is actually let's let's do that now. Um, would anyone like to type into the chat? How might you explain what they've got? Okay, so someone said that it seems like you have a viral infection that's causing your symptoms. Okay, now let me show you what might happen if you say that. So if I've got an infection, doctor, that's exactly why I want antibiotics. So can I have the antibiotics, please? You said that you'd examine me and ask questions and then let me know about it. Look, I, I waited patiently for all of that. Can I just have the antibiotics? Just, look, I don't want to lose any more time. Can I just have the antibiotics? You've just told me it's an infection. That's what antibiotics are for. Can I have an uh, antibiotic, please? Now, you see, sometimes mentioning the fact that you said viral, but you mentioned the word infection. And so often that will actually make the patient. What do the patient heard? They heard the word infection. When you've got an infection, what do you want? You want antibiotics. OK. Um, and so often that sometimes just mentioning the word infection, even though you've said a viral before it, now you have to go into the whole thing about viral and bacterial, which often can take a long time. Let me show you a way that, you know, if you can keep it, your explanations clear and concise, sometimes it's much easier. From examining you and from what you've described, what you've got is a really bad cold. Now, when you've got a really bad cold, if you've already got asthma, that can make your asthma much, much worse. And that's what's happened here. Thankfully, what you haven't got is a chest infection that antibiotics would work on. Now, you see, I've sold that as good news that thankfully, you haven't got. And so that's something really important that, you know, in terms of how you might explain about antibiotics um, and whether they need it or not, what some doctors will do is they'll say something like this. They'll say that, look, I don't think that antibiotics are going to be useful in this situation. I don't think. Really subtle. You can see, it sounds like it's just my opinion rather than if you frame it as a fact rather than an opinion. What you've got is a really bad cold. Now, antibiotics don't work on colds, okay? Do you see, that's a fact. Whereas if you say, I don't think you should have it, or sometimes people say as if they're denying a patient something that's really good. Um, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to give you as if it's bad news. Again, that often makes them want it even more. Sell it as good news. Good news is you don't need antibiotics. They don't work on colds. So the last thing you want is something that can't help you, but might actually give you side effects like diarrhea or vomiting which is going to make you even worse. You don't want to miss any more time from work. So you can see how you can actually sell it as the good news that is. And I found that when I do this in real life, it's much more effective. OK, so you know, saying things as a fact rather than opinion, that antibiotics don't work on colds. OK, and keeping it professional rather than personal. OK, you know, rather than I don't think you should have, I don't want you to, you know, it's great news that you don't need antibiotics you know, they won't work on this. and we wouldn't want you to have something that's not going to help you, but might actually make you worse. You can see you're not making it a, like you're, you're personally making this decision. And then they'll go to another doctor and say, oh, maybe they'll give it. That's their opinion. You've said it as a fact. OK, right. Good. So now this case is, again, one of 100. I've adapted a little bit, obviously, for this session, but it's one of 100 that we go through in our CSA 100 case crammer videos. So it's over eight hours of videos. Um, you get a PDF booklet. We do have the paper booklet as well. It's like 300 and 
something pages long, where you know we go through the data gathering, the um, management, the interpersonal, how to explain things. Um, so the, the booklet is available separately, but to get the most use of it, you, you, you know, use it with the videos. But for each of those hundred cases, we go through, you know, uh, key things to ask in history. What are the red flags? How to examine? current guidelines for management and interpersonal. Now, a lot of you might now be starting to think about the RCA, okay? So remember the RCA is going to run until August of next year, okay? The Royal Colleges have confirmed that the earliest that the CSA would come back is after August next year, and they will give six months notice. So our next RCA masterclass webinar, so this is a half day on how to pass the RCA, 1.30 till six is on the 3rd of October. This will be the last one that we're gonna run this year. We might run one early next year, okay? So we'll cover you know, how the examiners will mark your consultations, key techniques to get you a great score, but also techniques on a technical aspect, you know, how to uh, get the tech right, how to position it, how to get good audio, uh, you know, getting consent, how to select which consultations to submit. Because if you don't have all of the mandatory cases, you're automatically not gonna be able to pass the exam, okay? So you know how to pick those and how to pick cases that are of decent challenge. It's a good example. You know, if you just had a, straightforward upper respiratory tract infection, that would be too simple, and you would therefore not have an opportunity to get a good number of marks. But you see, the fact that this patient was very demanding right at the beginning, and they're really pushing for antibiotics, and you having to be able to negotiate that, you can see that brings a level of challenge, because sometimes challenge is something that's clinically really complex, okay? Sometimes the challenge is that it's the patient's behavior or the situation, or a combination of these things, okay? So anyway, We'll also look at the common reasons why people fail and how you can avoid them, the differences between RCA and CSA and how to approach them. And then we'll practice six interactive cases, okay? So two telephone, two video, two face-to-face. -face. By the end of this half day, you'll have a real clear plan on how to you know, get great recordings and pass the RCA. Um, and then our full day intensive RCA course, where we have simulators, both male and female. Uh, we have two examiners, so myself and another one, and you go through 25 cases uh, role plays by the end of the day, uh, including at least two full mock cases that you will get detailed individual feedback on what you need to work on. And you get access to 65 cases to practice uh, and use as like checklists afterwards. This, if you book our full day course, the next one is the 12th of November, that's available. We do have one in October, but it's full, okay? The 12th of November, I think it's got two spaces left, okay? Um, you get access to this included, okay? Um, we only take nine people on each course. And for that, there's two simulators and there's two trainers. So, you know, there's a lot of faculty. It just means that everyone gets lots of individual practice and lots of, uh, you know, opportunity to get feedback. That, that's the really important to us, rather than take a, a bigger group so that, you know, you won't get as much uh, individual chance. So again, with the RCA Masterclass or the RCA, same code, eMedica15, you can get a 15% discount until midnight tonight. So I want to touch on portfolio careers for the last 10 minutes. Um, and then, you know, we can all um, enjoy the rest of our evening, right? So what is a portfolio GP? It's a GP with multiple roles. So usually people will have a base clinical role, and then they might add to that some non-clinical roles, but they might also add some non-medical roles, some things that are outside of medicine, okay? So I'll, I'll give you an example. I've been a portfolio GP ever since I, I completed GP training. Actually, even when I was a registrar, I was a, a portfolio um had a portfolio career. And then I'm going to go through three case studies of, you know, three good friends, doctors that um, I've met and worked with, and some of them trained over the years, just to give some ideas of things that people do. So, you know, people have a base clinical role. So for example, I've been working on and off as a locum in the, this NHS practice, inner city practice, ever since I qualified as a GP, like 13 odd years ago. I've worked in the past as a prison GP. Uh, I still work in community detox. Um, I've done medicals for the army. Um, I'm a partner in my own practice. My practice is a private practice. Um, and then I'm a resident GP in this place, Beverly House, which is a secure unit for women with significant mental health illness. So I have a psych team that looks after their mental health. And myself and my partner in our practice, we look after all of their uh, GP needs, you know, their primary care. Um, and then I've got an interest in uh, humanitarian and global medicine. So over the years, I've been on deployment with doctors worldwide and uh, some other organizing, but primarily them. So this was uh, 15 odd years ago, Sri Lanka after the tsunami. This was uh, Noshera in Pakistan in 2010. Uh, this was Lesvos in Greece uh, a few years ago. And this was my most recent deployment uh, to the um, camps where a lot of the Rohingya population are in Bangladesh, uh, which is where I was born, okay? Um, and here, 
one of the things I'm really proud about that I got to be part of the first um, cohort that developed a fellowship program. So all of these are doctors working locally there and we train them up. So rather than me just seeing patients, which I've done in all of the other ones, by training the doctors that are going to stay there after I've come back, we hope that we can you know, um, leave a longer lasting impact. Uh, and you know, that's been taken on now. We work with the UN with that. And then non-clinical, you know, my main role is in medical education. So as medical director of eMedica, I teach anywhere from medical students, people getting into training, MRCGP, GP trainers. Um, I've been an examiner. So I examined for PLAB2 for many years, and I'm still an examiner for finals for Liverpool Medical School. Um, and then I teach for different deaneries. Um, I've been working with the Royal College recently to run some national revision courses. And then I've also worked as, um, you know, developing e-learning and as an author and editor. So, you know, the case cards, the GP careers guide, uh, new ones about to come out. Uh, these were in Innovate about AKT, CSA, uh, study guide, new version of that is coming out with the MPS. And then I just want to introduce you to three fantastic doctors that I've worked with or, um, uh, you know, met or trained over the years. So this is Dr. Ishtiak Rahman, just to give some ideas. So he was a partner, but as he started doing more and more additional roles in his portfolio career, he left his partnership and now works as a locum as his main clinical role. So he has more flexibility. So what he does is he's the team doctor for the England under 18s football club. So he goes around the world when they're doing tournaments. In fact, they won the World Cup uh, a couple of years ago. OK, um, he's also before that, for five years, he was the team doctor uh, for Sunderland Football Club when they were in the Premier League. Um, he left and they were demoted after that. I'm not saying they're linked. Um, and then he's got an interest in sports and exercise medicine. That's, you know, he's a GP with specialist interest in that. That's how he got that role. But he also does um, medicals and assessments for the Royal Army at the local army base near where he lives. He lives up north. OK, so that's Ishtiak. And I first met Ishtiak when we went to Pakistan together with Doctors Worldwide. Um, this is Dr. Nigga Arif. So she works as a private GP. She's a GP with specialist interest in women's health. She works in medical education. In fact, she teaches on our national GP trainee conference. So some of you will have met her there. She did the women's health workshop for us there. She's also written various articles. She's involved in the community. Um, she's uh, the CCG lead for various things. And then she's got a bigger and bigger role during lockdown as a media GP. So she's the resident GP on BBC Breakfast now. And then this is Dr. Avishal Sharma. Now, hopefully next month or the month after, I'm going to get Avishal to come on and answer some of your questions live. OK, so um, he also was a partner for many years. Um, he now works as a locum as his main clinical role. He works in medical education. So sometimes he is one of the trainers on our CSA course. Um, and then he's a certified hot yoga instructor. And actually now he's doing more and more work. You can see that's not clinical. It's not medical. It's something just completely different. So he runs like you know, he's got loads of people from all over the world logging in. He runs these uh, sessions uh, through Zoom. OK, um, so he's a certified hot yoga instructor. OK, just to give you an idea of different things that you could do. So just for two or three minutes, if you were going to develop a portfolio career, and it's increasingly popular over the last 10, 15 years. What would you like to include? Any thoughts of things that you'd like to do at all? OK, so teaching, a lot of people interested in medical education. By the way, if you're interested to get a foot into medical education, one of the ways I got started is I used to write questions for the MRCGP um, in the old days when I did MRCGP, it was before AKT existed, the old MRCGP. Um, so, you know, I'd write a batch of questions each month for a, an online portal with answer and explanation. So we're recruiting freelance authors to write questions. So if you've passed AKT, you could write for our AKT service. If you've passed RCA or CSA, you could write for our CSA service. For anyone in training, you've passed MSRA, you could write for our MSRA or our medical final service. You know, drop an email. So if someone said uh, um, ultrasound, MSK, sports medicine, surgical, uh, prison GP, mentoring, uh, aesthetics, um, pediatrics, teaching, um, FGM victims, um, sports and exercise medicine, public health role. All of these are possible, okay, addiction, um, oh, this is a really interesting one. So someone said they'd like to own a cafe, um, do some eyes specialty, join a medical border. Um, I'm not sure what that bit means, but uh, the owner cafe I like. I'd love to one day open a little cafe or restaurant. So uh, get in touch, Tina. Maybe we can do something together. Healthy eating and cooking. Great. Uh, hospice work. Outside of GP, the best 
clinical work I ever did was working at Birmingham St. Mary's Hospice. I actually left medicine for a while and I took a job there when I was finishing off my master's to pay the bills and I fell back in love with medicine. And, you know, you see the how people can come together to look after the true needs of the patients and true patient centeredness it is fantastic. OK, well, oh, fantastic. Someone's an author. They wrote a book, the Teenager's Guidebook. Congratulations. Uh, someone wants to open a studio for fitness classes um, for NHS staff mindfulness and yoga so you know people that are interested in that kind of thing you find it really interesting i'm going to see if i can you know dr sharma's really really busy but um, he's agreed to come on here so i'm hoping next month if not next month the month after i'm going to get him on here and the last part will actually be a live q a you'll be able to ask him questions okay if you've got questions maybe you can send me some in advance and i'll interview him but we'll have some live okay great so any questions now um you know, ask them in the Q&A and I will go through them. Um, and just before I do that, I know some of you will be leaving. Just before we go, please do join the GP Training Support Facebook group. If you're not already a member, it's the largest, most active Facebook group for GP training. We've got 20,700 plus doctors on there now. Uh, do subscribe to our YouTube channel. Let us know what you think. I will contact you soon to get some feedback. And I will send out the booklet, the handout, um, and the video recording of this, I'll probably not be able to do it tomorrow because I'm really busy. I've got to prepare for uh, things that I've got to do this weekend, but I'll try and get it out to you early next week. So that's the GP training support group. Someone will post a link for you. And this is our YouTube channel. So you can find past sessions of this if you missed, the lockdown learning, uh, various other free teaching is on there. And just really to say, thank you very much for joining. For those that haven't got questions, I hope it's been useful to you. Keep pushing, keep going, prepare, and you will succeed. Thank you so much. Have a great evening.